attention, please. All of those who are passionate about fighting for racial and economic justice, please step forward. Our program is about to begin. And if you would like to follow the night on social media, please use the hashtag ShriverGala20. Let the game begin. Yeah, Team Fig still rolling. You ready? Okay. okay. Good evening. So happy to be here to welcome you to this first virtual fundraiser for the Shriver Center. My name is Ann Williams. I'm a retired judge of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit. So happy this evening to have as my co-host, Bill Lowry. Bill? Thank you, Judge, and it's an honor to be here with you and with all of you. I am Bill Lowry, Cook County Commissioner of the Third District. We're honored to serve as co-chairs, and we're to open night one of the Shriver Center on Poverty Law's Virtual Gala, a call for racial justice. What better time to call for racial justice when you look at what our nation is facing today? And tonight, we focus on helping to answer that call, activating, activating the nation. As supporters of the Shriver Center and its mission for economic and racial justice, Bill and I officially welcome you to our first virtual fundraiser. Tonight, is designed to inspire you and to inspire all of you to action just as it has inspired me and Bill to action. Right, Bill? That's right. We're inspired and we hope you are as well. Above you will find your donate button. Press it, press it, and press it again. Or you may text on your phone to Shriver Center in capital letters 41444 to receive a donate link. We invite you to give generously as you are able. And remember what Bill said, press it, press it, press the button. Press the button. We are thrilled in part to be here because of the new leadership of the Shriver Center. The new president and CEO, someone I have known for many years, who, whose career I have followed through the years, she's an extraordinary human being, and a gifted leader and just the perfect person to lead the Shriver Center. I was thrilled, as I said, when she applied, I was thrilled and she got the offer. I was thrilled when the board offered her the position and even more thrilled when she said yes, because she's a doer, she's a doer and she's a person of action. And she will set out with the wonderful staff of the Shriver, Shriver Center to put the vision and mission in action. With that, Audra Wilson. Go Audra. Thank you, Ann and Bill, for that introduction. Welcome to our virtual gala. It's a new day in so many ways. Our country is battling a global pandemic and our way of life has been forever altered. Our country is facing its longtime sin of racism and the legacy of slavery. And I'm here leading the Shriver Center on Poverty Law as its first Black CEO amidst all this external change. I'm returning home to the organization after starting my career here nearly two decades ago. As I reflect often on this past year, I'm reminded of the ways in which our organization's mission matters more than ever. For many years, We've advocated for economic and racial justice, for the basic elements of a just society, health care for all, secure, affordable housing, fair workplaces, and access to food. And now we're tackling the important work of dismantling systems that oppress Black and Latino families by working to end mass incarceration and keep families together and out of our foster systems. Amidst all this advocacy work, we're training and supporting lawyers, advocates across the country through our networks. Tonight, we kick off three evenings of conversation and action for racial justice. I want to thank our sponsors for the support to make this program happen. Our title sponsor, GCM Grossman, and presenting sponsors, AARP Foundation, 
JP Morgan Chase and Company, and Sidley Austin. This evening, we're excited to hear from our rising Shriver Center leaders and also artists who leverage their craft to call for change. As someone who's both a lawyer and a musician, I appreciate this intersection and encourage us all to explore the various ways everyone can be an advocate. Our speakers tonight will inspire us to use our talents, abilities, and voices to call for change. Listen, share on social media, and take it all in. And I'll check back in later to talk about how we move forward. And now, let's roll our first video. In so many ways, this moment in time is so crucial for the Shriver Center as it is for the rest of the country. Shriver's work has always been evergreen. As long as there's been poverty, as long as there's been racial injustice, we've been here fighting that good fight. This is a moment where our work is being highlighted. This is that moment where people finally see, wow, this is what you've been fighting for for all these years. And so everything that we've been saying for over 50 years, talking about why it is so important for us to be focusing on racial and economic justice, people now see manifested in COVID and manifested in, in this period of racial awakening. COVID-19 only exacerbated issues communities are faced with every day. Our advocacy agenda ensured policies and laws were enacted to provide immediate and long-term relief. We're fighting to unify families and the foster system. Parents should not be cut off from access to their children. That's why here in Illinois and across the country, advocates are coming together to push these systems to safeguard parents' constitutional rights. We are fighting back against the cruel public charge rule expand the SNAP program. So everybody has the right to paid sick leave or paid family and medical leave when they need it. For housing and environmental justice. We won healthcare access for immigrants. We're able to take the wins that we've gotten and replicate them around the country state by state. Change laws and change lives. Not one, not two, not thousands, but millions of people. This is just a fraction of our work and there's still so much more to do. And that's why we need to use this momentum to propel our work forward. Today, we litigate, shape policy, and train multi-state networks of lawyers, community leaders, and activists nationwide. We work with and for the people most impacted by inequity. To pursue justice for all. With equal dignity, respect, and power under the law. We see ourselves as building up an army of advocates that are equipped to do their anti-poverty work with racial justice at the core. Understanding the importance of community lawyering is understanding as a legal advocate that you are working in partnership, in collaboration with community, and you are not the lead of this movement. There's more of an urgency when it's actually your situation, when you're the one or your family member is actually the one that's being discriminated. There's a direct correlation between race and equity. We can't do anything if we cannot dismantle this system. And until we address our history and our racist history as a country, then we can't necessarily move forward to equity and to equality. Everybody is worth opportunity. Everyone should have access to opportunity. There's more than enough resources for everyone. This movement will end when we've actually eradicated poverty and eradicated racism. There's power in, in believing in the possibility of change. I think the misconception is that we don't need each other, but we do. We need to make sure that our systems are giving people what they actually need to live a dignified life. Because Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. It's really about reframing how we value people. Regardless of race or where they come from. And it means holding our institutions accountable. This is the future we're fighting for. Where everyone has the power to determine their futures. Using litigation and policy advocacy to affect change where it's needed most. Everybody has a role to play to get us where we need to go. And you can be a part of that. We need donations to continue the work. We need people to lead the charge. To unapologetically tackle racial inequities. We need to vote. Because every single person can make a difference. And when all of us come together, we make the difference. Please give us your ideas, your perspectives, and your voices. You're actually part of this right now. We're all part of the movement. No podemos hacer esto sin ti. And we can't do this work without you. We are the movement.
Good evening. My name is Dr. D'Angelo Taylor, and I'm a member of the Shriver Professionals Council. I'm currently the Assistant Director for the Multicultural Center at the University of Southern Indiana here in Evansville. I'm excited to be in a conversation tonight with Ms. Bella Boz. Bella is a rap, raptivist, spoken word artist, storyteller, and movement strategist. She was thrust into the national spotlight in 2015 when a video of her heartfelt performance at a local march for justice for Laquan McDonald went viral. Bella, thank you so much for joining us here tonight. Thank you for having me. Thank you. I'm excited. I'm excited. You just told me that you are in Indiana right now, right? Right. I'm in Indiana. I'm enjoying. I'm enjoying the uh, the the rural setting. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm far removed from that. <laughs> uh, okay. I'm in Chicago though, so not really far removed, but that's kind of like a whole different world, you know. All right. So speaking of, uh, you know, you being in Chicago right now. Just reading your bio, it says that you were born in Chicago. Uh, tell us a story about, I guess, your experience in growing up in Chicago and uh, what you've observed as far as poverty, economic inequality, and racism. So I know that's a lot, but tell us about your experience growing up. Okay, so yeah, I'm from the west side of Chicago. Well, I'm actually a first generation Chicagoan. So okay. My mother was born in Mississippi. My mother's mother was born in Mississippi. Like, we we got southern roots, okay? okay. <laughs> um, but, so when you hear me talk, you might hear that also. You might hear All like, right. Okay. Playing in there. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a, that's a lot of people's stories in this city, right? So right. I can't even really talk about Chicago and talk about my story without kind of going back a little bit and talking. Right, about giving us the foundation. You know, you know, really giving us the foundation. And so even my name, right? So Bella Boz. Boz mm -hmm. is B-A-H-H-S. That's Black Ancestors Here Healing Society. So okay. like, I, I can't just talk about me, you know, because I know that the story doesn't begin with me. You right. know, I'm here on um, the backs and the bloods and the bones of so many people. Right. <laughs> you know, so I, I like to name that first and foremost, like, you know, I, I am a, a vessel for some of our most revolutionary ancestors to speak through. Right. Um, and one of those being my grandmother, who okay. <laughs> is, grew up in Mississippi, wow. uh, in Mississippi, on a plantation. She was a sharecropper's daughter. So, wow. slave, you know, by another name. Mm. Uh, and, yeah, so she grew up picking cotton from sunup to sundown. You know, like that was her childhood. That's her upbringing. She grew up witnessing lynchings and um, wow. these bowments of, of Black people. Like she, <laughs> like, I, what I do is tell my story, right? Like that's okay. what I do with my art. And I tell my grandmother's story because I really want to give people a Black woman's history of, of America of what it means to exist here. Know where I come from, I'm proud of. All of my heroes were Panthers. Some say I'm biased for Wakanda. We got the juice like Wakanda. Know where I come from, I'm proud of. All of my heroes were Panthers. Some say I'm biased for Wakanda. We got the juice like Wakanda. For all of my people, I pray. I love you like Kanye loves Jay. But I am married to my race. My sister's behind me. I toast the bouquet. I mean, pass the baton. Black women magic. We soak up the sun and we give you your sons. Yeah, Chicago. <laughs> Chicago being this dream place for my grandmother, right? Like this being a destination for Black people in right. the South who have survived slavery at this point, are surviving Jim Crow, are surviving America, you know? Um, and she came to Chicago, came to the North seeking sanctuary, right? Seeking better opportunity. Um, and what she found here, <laughs> um, what I know now, you know, now that I have her 
vision and hindsight, I have my experience. What I know now is that there, it was never any sanctuary to be found here. You know, the, the war on drugs is a big part of America. So this is what I grew up in, right? And this is like kind of how I understand history is through this black woman's lens and my lineage of black women. So, you know, my mother went to prison in this war on drugs, you know? And <laughs> this is Chicago, like this is the Chicago I've grown, I've, I know, right? So I know the, <laughs> I know I know Chicago in a way that um, I don't think it's talked about often. As you can see in, in many of these cities, there, there is a lot of advocacy that takes place in the, in the streets. And so here at the Shriver Center on Poverty Law, uh, it's, no, it's no, uh, no secret that we utilize litigation and policy advocacy to change these laws and hopefully and ultimately hoping to change lives. And so uh, I'd like to, you know, get, pick your brain about, can, can you talk about how you use your voice, your art, and, you know, how do you use even your upbringing and that foundation to advance justice in, in the Black community? Yeah, I just offer a different perspective, uh, a different perspective that's needed because it's not like um, people don't have voices, like we don't have stories to tell. They just often get ignored or get muffled, get distorted, get silenced. We are Black history, it's in the making. Even if we don't, our story's gonna make it. And so you talk about revolution and, and I want to stay kind of in that same frame. And so what would you do, uh, how, what would you recommend our audience do to advance racial justice? Because you, you know, it's, it's not enough just to be in the battlefield by yourself. You need to have some soldiers with you. And so what would you do or uh, what would you uh, suggest that our, our, our viewers tonight do uh, to push forward uh, on racial justice? We got to do some harm reduction things. We got to right. study our local elections, um, what we are voting for, who we are voting for, because it has to be like, we have to know that things are not going to happen overnight. So what we do today is going to impact tomorrow. And we have to be like, you know, by the time I entered this fight, the fight had been going on <laughs> for okay. thousands of years, you know? So it's just like, what are we, what are we doing for this time right now to make it better? To make it better, to make it better, to make it better. That is our responsibility. Again, thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate you. And uh, once again, uh, your story is truly amazing. Uh, I so appreciate you. This has been great. Thank you. I, this was like you were sitting on the couch with me and we was having a conversation. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Anti-poverty work has been going on for generations. And it's more important now than ever to work with communities to lift them up. We stand with people who experience oppression every day. That's what motivates me to get out of the bed because I know it's people who come from the very same community that I came from. And I want them to have the very same opportunity that I have. We listen to black voices, Latino voices, and the voices of communities of color. We accept. It is our duty to fight for equity. We unapologetically tackle racial inequities together. We're trying to eradicate poverty. That's how I see my work. I'm trying to get rid of it entirely. I'm not trying to improve the situation of people in poverty. I, there should be no poverty. I'm trying to get rid of poverty. And when that does not happen for one group, it harms us all. And I think that's what people are feeling right now in this moment. I'm Jessica Cohen, and I'm a member of the Shriver Center's Professional Council. I am also the Senior Director of Strategic Communications for the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, another advocacy organization. I'm so excited to be with you tonight to have the privilege to sit down and interview two hardworking individuals from the Shriver Center. Tonight, we're going to feature Rudy Hancock, the Shriver Center's Government Relations Liaison. Rudy's going to tell us a little bit about her work to advance advocacy and policy initiatives for economic and racial justice in Illinois. And we're also going to speak with Generic Holmes, who is the Associate Director of the Shriver Center's, Shriver Center's Racial Justice Institute. Generic helps engage equal justice advocates across the country through online trainings and work to support 
the Racial Justice Institute Network, which is a growing cadre of more than 300 advocates committed to advancing a coordinated racial justice advocacy agenda. I'm so excited to have them here with me tonight. Thank you both. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having us. All right, well, Generic, let's start with you. Tell us more about the Racial Justice Institute. Why does race matter? How are race and advocacy related? So, you know, when we ignore race, um, as advocates, we're often ignoring a central part of the issue. Uh, a racial justice analysis can really help us begin to sort of dismantle and break apart these like really serious and big structural issues that we often see, but can be really hard to kind of pull apart and solve. Uh, so for instance, why is COVID-19 developing at uh, a really fast rate in Black communities and Latino communities and Latinx communities? Uh, why are Black women more likely to be evicted from their homes? Um, why are young males of color uh, suspended and expelled at a higher rate? Uh, mm -hmm. Kind of putting them on that pathway to the school to prison pipeline. Uh, so, you know, we want to do things like apply a systems analysis to, again, begin to sort of dismantle those systems and really look at them in a different way uh, and look at who are the decision makers, like what are their mental models, like where are those points in the system where their biases start mm -hmm. to creep in and really begin to uh, create racialized outcomes that have a negative impact for our clients. Um, and always sort of that cyclical effect for our clients so that those same uh, mothers are having to come to the school to advocate for those same young males of color who continue to be getting sent home at that disparate rate, right? So those are sort of some of the strategies that we employ in, in RJI. It's incredibly important work. And I think um, we're at a time in society where we're starting to shine the light on why this is so important. And it's great that you've been doing this work and have an opportunity to elevate it further in today's society. Rudy, the work of the Shriver Center is to lead advocacy in the states, uh, particularly in its home, states of, home state of Illinois. For our audiences who may be newer to this work, um, you know, we know that policy advocacy involves influencing decision makers and elected officials to change our laws and policies. But I think it would be helpful, Rudy, for you to share a little bit about the racial justice issues that the Shriver Center has been working on this past year. I'm sure there are many, but I think uh, maybe you could highlight uh, a couple. <laughs> Yes, you are very right. There are many efforts um, that we really worked on in response to COVID-19. We really pivoted our work and advocacy efforts this past year to ensure that we were meeting immediate and long-term needs in these challenging times. Um, I can give a few examples. We advocated for the early release of people from jails and prisons, where the risk of exposure was far greater because of their inability to be able to social distance. Mm -hmm. um, we really appealed to state authorities as well, political officials, elected officials, to address the inequities in the criminal legal system that so many face every day. It's so troubling that we find ourselves in a place where white people are released from prison at much higher rates and much earlier than their Black and Latino Latinx counterparts. Another thing that we really worked hard and long on um, is the DCFS issue with, um, they had a ban in place for visitation during the pandemic. And it, during that time, it is so important for children to be with their families. So we really work to, you know, lift that ban. Um, the ban really impacted low income and black and Latino Latinx families in the foster care system. And that was something that we really needed to address. We also passed our Healthy Illinois Initiative, which was a really big win for us in the General Assembly during the special session. Um, we became the first state in the nation to provide comprehensive health care to seniors regardless of immigration status. So in general, general, it's just been very important to look at structural inequities and ensure that we have that relief in place to really focus on the people that we work with and wanting to address race equity. Kudos to you for such hard work and to your team. I mean, just 
really important issues right now in, in Illinois. I know especially um, that has been hit harder from COVID. I think the work you're doing is so meaningful. And those um, were only a few. We have so many more that I could spend hours talking to you about. <laughs> yeah. Um, if only we had that kind of time. <laughs> Too bad we can't be sitting all together and, and chatting over coffee, but we'll, we'll um, maybe get that opportunity once the pandemic is over. <laughs> Moving on a, to a little bit more of a personal question, um, Generic and Rudy, as Black advocates, I imagine this work is pretty personal to you. Um, what motivates you to continue this work? What are some of the challenge you, challenges you face if you feel comfortable sharing? Fortunately for me, I um, am a part of this network of 300 advocates who are working on race equity issues uh, all across the country. So that movement um, yeah. provides me a lot of energy for the fight. Um, just seeing their resilience mm -hmm. uh, is also, you know, very helpful for me. I think as far as challenges go, you know, it is sort of challenging going through this kind of collective trauma uh, as an African-American, as an African-American male. Um, but then there's also a lot of beauty in, um, in that perspective. And mm -hmm. I try my best to center that whenever possible. Um, you know, this past weekend, I actually saw a segment about Sam Cooke, mm -hmm. uh, who's like a singer songwriter, mm -hmm. um, civil rights activist in like the yeah. 50s, 60s. Um, a favorite of mine. <laughs> <laughs> so good. And what I didn't realize is that um, that song, A Change Is Gonna Come, mm -hmm. uh, was written after he was arrested for basically being black uh, really? at a hotel. Um, and so I, I guess I just point that out um, because you know there are these challenges with, that sort of come with this identity, um, but then at the same time, uh, there are these sort of beautiful moments, um, mm -hmm. I think, that come from that perspective as well, and that come from just trying to reimagine what our future could be. What really motivates me to continue this work, which is a driving force for me, is knowing that I'm making a difference. I'm doing this work on behalf of people I may never meet, and that's okay, because every policy and every bill that I help to enact is creating a more fair and equitable environment for us all, and that's really what motivates me every single day to fight for what's right. I don't necessarily see challenges in this work. I, I more so see opportunities for change and reform. Mm -hmm. We have a little bit more time to kind of talk uh, for one last question I have for you all. Um, you know, changing laws and systems that have been around for decades is a really big task. Um, why should people support this effort? Um, you know, I can imagine it might feel for them like an uphill battle that they just can't win. And what would you tell them? Why should they support the efforts of a policy organization like Shriver Center and, and some of this long-term work? I mean, I would say, you know, there are forces at work, people who are sort of dedicated to keep these unjust laws and practices in place. Uh, and mitigating that is going to take resources. It's going to take dedicated time and manpower. Um, you know, the question really reminds me of that, uh, that really great Audre Lorde quote, like you're not going to dismantle the master's house using the master's tools. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of paraphrasing, um, but I say that to say that uh, it's going to require a bit of innovation uh, and innovation takes time, dedication and resources. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you have to try new things. You can't just keep banging your head against the same wall and hoping that it'll change things. So I think you're right. Innovation is critical. Um, Rudy, what, what do you think? Why, why should people support this work when it feels sometimes so hard to do? It does seem like a heavy lift, but really this work is just so vital and just so critical to the well-being of our society, especially in the times that we're living in right now. And I just feel like we need to really stand together to lay the groundwork for real systemic change for generations to come. And we need help with that. We can't do it alone. We need supporters who believe in this work, who believe in us to carry on this work, to really do it and to really make a change. 
much. Um, I think we're just at time. I wish that we could sit and talk for hours, um, but unfortunately our time is up, but I just want to thank you so much. Um, as a longtime member of the professional council, it's been so rewarding to talk with you both tonight and to learn a bit more about what you do and hear why it's so important and particu particularly from the lens of the world we're living in now where change is so needed. And I just thank you both and applaud you both for the hard work that you and your teams are doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, where do we go from here? When we imagine an equitable world, what does that look like? Together, we're building a future free from poverty and racism. We can't do this work alone. What would it take for us to get there? Where everyone has the power to determine their futures. What can we do in this moment to create that vision? Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Jonathan McGee. I am a member of the Shrivers Professional Council. I'm also Deputy Director of Regional Economic Development at the Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity. And I have the distinct pleasure and honor, and I am excited to speak with Kendrick Sampson. For those who know or for those who don't know, he is an actor, an activist, best known for his portrayal as Nathan in HBO's critically acclaimed and secure. Uh, Kendrick has used his voice to empower marginalized communities and really shine a light on issues of inequity across the nation and quite frankly the world. Um, and you know, Kendrick has truly leveraged his platform uh, being in Hollywood to really activate uh, his platform and influence to uh, motivate the nation, activate the nation through art and advocacy, which you all know is a theme uh, in this gala this year. And so uh, with that being said, I'm going to jump right in, Kendrick, and ask my first question. So a lot of this work that you're doing um, really is aimed at dismantling stru structural inequities and really is about changing hearts and minds. Um, you know, the nonprofit you built, Build Power, is really at the intersection of grassroots and, and narrative activism. Um, but like, could we talk a little bit about what does this specific form of advocacy looks like? And why is it important um, to how you pursue justice? And really, what really helped you kind of come up with this idea? And could you just talk a little bit more about uh, your efforts with Build Power and, and how others uh, can get involved, uh, can be motivated and influenced, and continue to drive change as well? Yeah, um, we are, I was co-founded by uh, Tia Osho and Mike De La Rocha, who I knew for a while and we were, we all had separate efforts to um, connect our networks in the grassroots space, grass, grassroots space to uh, Hollywood. And we, you know, I, we had our difficulties. And um, these were some of my advisors and there were a bunch of people that I worked with all over the country. Um, you know, 2015, I got involved with Black Lives Matter Los Angeles. Uh, 2016, went to Standing Rock and, you know, encountered, we got involved with the presidential campaign um, as a national surrogate and had all of these experiences um, and was looking for mentorship in the industry because it's a bit different use, utilizing your platform as an artist, as a public figure, as, a, um, uh, as an actor, as whatever, right? You, we all have unique experiences and platforms. Um, I like to remind everybody that everybody got a platform, right? Their life, uh, even if they're not on social media. Um, but we all have very unique platforms and experiences and there are very specific things to um, uh, having the exposure of an actor or a musician or an athlete, right? And I was looking for mentorship in that area, didn't find it. And so the things that I cobbled together in the network and the community that I cobbled together, I wanted to give people access to so that they can have the same information um, or experiences or relationships to inform their work, inform their decisions, inform the roles that they uh, pick, the, the scripts that they write, um, and, the, and the 
political, uh, like the, the issues that they support and how they support it and the ideologies that they put behind that, right? And so we, we streamlined it with Build Power by creating some programming around trainings and, and, um, and creating safe spaces to build community, intentional community between these radical, dope grassroots liberators and Hollywood um, athletes, actors, directors, producers, such and such, right? And so our goal in a very short, I try to truncate it because I'm long-winded and I'm from the South, so I speak slow. So I know I only got your attention for a little bit, but um, to truncate it, it's it, the, the purpose, our purpose is to perpetuate um, liberation culture in Hollywood, to build and perpetuate liberation culture in Hollywood. Since we've been so, uh, we as Hollywood, Hollywood has been um, systemically involved in oppression and perpetuating oppression um, in so many different forms, all the forms that we know, white supremacy, misogyny, transphobia, anti-indigeneity, anti-blackness, the list goes on and on and on. It encourages st systemic violence um, and state violence. So we want to change that. The same way that we have institutional um, oppression, we want to have institutional liberation. We want to stop talking about diversity and inclusion so much and actually talk about how we get involved in liberation. I appreciate that. And like, you know, I think you're spot on because I, I, I realize that as myself, somebody who works within the system, it's always a barrier. It's always an obstacle. It's always a reason why we can't uh, radically change something and while we have to do all of these incremental changes. And I would argue that at this moment, um, what we're seeing potentially, right, uh, is, is a failure of the system. So I think you're spot on. And really quick before I get off this question, what are some of those wins you saw? Because I do agree with you that once Hollywood gets behind something, so once we someone with a platform gets behind something, things start to move. So, so have you seen any wins with Bill Power? What are some success stories uh, that you could share with us about the work that you all are doing? I don't, some of them I don't want to get too specific, uh, but um, I really do want to dig into them, but I'm like, mm, maybe, but there's, you know, we've gotten behind some, um, some legislation uh, and produced, um, um, or there was some legislation around police violence that we produced some PSAs around and got some celebrities engaged. Um, and, and really the successes that we see more than anything, because um, we've been involved in several things in immigration causes, I mean, immigration legislation, um, immigration and, and raising awareness around it and sending people to the border to make sure that they get educated um, and building programming around taking people across the border and understanding what the experience is and who the most vulnerable are even within the community of migrants that are that are being persecuted um, and talking about black migrants and trans migrants and um, the, you know everybody doesn't really understand the nuances there um, and the organizations that are doing that work and introducing people uh, to ecological justice that understands the people that are most uh, affected by climate change usually being indigenous and black folks right um, and what that looks like and what it looks like to center uh, the people closest to the pain, what it looks like to center those who are most vulnerable in leadership and not co-opt their work that they've been doing for years, the great work that they've been doing for years, but to support it. Um, but a lot of the, the successes that we see are in personal growth, right? In, in um the relationships that are built between these uh, dope liberators all over the country, whether they be radical professors and academics or um, grassroots organizers, organizations, community or based organizations, um, and seeing people start to develop their own relationship and own work with these people and these organizations. Um, and really be in community with them, or you see their conversations start to change, or the way that they advocate start to change, and they become more creative and and um, and bold uh, in their in their advocacy, in their activism, in their organizing. Seeing some actors and and musicians and such actually organize people um, is really really incredible. So those are the real successes that we're looking for, um, but. 
uh, we also had, you know, I don't know if we would call this a success, but it was a successful effort and it's still ongoing. So we had, um, when we were looking at the whole defund the police movement and what Black Lives Matter and Hollywood uh, and movement for Black Lives was doing, we uh, created, uh, uh, put together, got all these different consultants and, and um, people that are what we call below the line in Hollywood um, and above the line, uh, which means, you know, above, below the line are like crew, um, gaffers, grips, uh, uh, you know, stage managers, line producers, all of these different folks that make this industry run, the most important people in this industry, right? We made sure that we understood what their efforts were um, and what they were fighting for and what the barriers were to Black people in those spaces because a lot of the unions have very racist practices and policies and a lot of blockades to um, to board positions. And so looking from the, from the top down, the bottom up and all through and between and all the gray areas, just trying to identify all the efforts going on, incorporated as many as we could into this letter and calling out Hollywood and their participation and leadership in anti-Blackness. Um, and we put together this effort and, and uh, released this letter and over 300 amazing Black uh, professionals, including celebrities like Viola Davis and Zoe Saldana and, um, and Charles King and uh, Michael B. Jordan and all of these incredible people signed this letter, um, Rick F Fikamuya. And there was just so, so um, many dope people that came to, to the aid and and Tessa Thompson was a part of organizing it and Kerry Washington, they all put pitched in and, and did some incredible work. And, and it, was, it was incredible to see that um, so many black folks come together and lead this effort and, and come together in solidarity with the movement to lift up uh, what we could do in Hollywood to remove police from our ecosystem and stand with the defunding movement that has been across the, the nation and also uh, advocate for community, um, to uplift the community, uh, the broader community and um, fight for policy and, and all types of you know, careers and such. So it was, it was pretty incredible and, it, and it's still going, still going. I appreciate that. You basically like touched on so many things I'm gonna ask you, but the big piece <laughs> here and the big conversation here we know is police brutality. Right. We know that we continue to see uh, the murders of black lives by police. We're seeing protests across the nation. Uh, I'm sure you saw what went down here in Chicago, both peaceful protests and riots uh, as our, our city navigates decades of uh, community disinvestment, gun violence and police misconduct. You mentioned that you're a member of Black Lives Matter Los Angeles, uh, where you live today. Um, what is the movement? And you've touched, like, touched on this, but what does the movement for Black Lives look like on the West Coast? And what does Black power look like on the West Coast, especially uh, your work in Hollywood and how you're leading the charge today with everything you're doing with Bill Power? Yeah, I've been, it's interesting because the primary places, we work all over the U.S., but uh, the primary places that we, uh, that I work, my personal activism is in, in community is in Texas and in uh, California, and it is very different. Um, there's some place, things in Texas and especially in Houston where I'm from where we're far ahead of the game in Cal than California and California same thing uh, in LA um, vice versa but um, it's incredible I mean we have some 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 just um, I don't even know. I, I, I'm, I'm so impressed with the community that we have, the liberation community that we have here, like Patrice Cullors, uh, who co-founded Black Lives Matter, and M Dr. Melina Abdullah, who uh, founded uh, Black Lives Matter Los Angeles, the first chapter of BLM, and, and you have Isaac Bryan, who's leading the charge with Measure, Measure J and Eunices, and then you have um, uh, just so many incredible, incredible, incredible people here. Um, but we started pushing to look at budgets and, and, 
and uh, Black Lives Matter Los Angeles, um, this is just one example, uh, led the charge on gathering information on uh, from a bunch of Angelinos, over 20,000 Angelinos on what they think the budget should look like because we realized that LA was spending over 52% of their budget on policing. Um, and it was being, that, that money was going towards oppression of black and brown and indigenous folks. Um, and there's inherent, like inherent uh, and pervasive corruption throughout this institution. And this money should be, they're, they're being tasked with, you know, mental health uh, and homeless and, and solving the homelessness crisis and all of these things. And instead they're just criminalizing them and putting them into jails and prisons. So we um, helped uh, Black Lives Matter Los Angeles as Bill Power um, amplify this study, amplify these, this um, survey, and then present the findings to uh, uh, the city council in a special, a special presentation where we're usually getting dragged out of those chambers, by the people, but we were invited in and, um, and we uh, presented what, what it looks like to reimagine safety and what safety really is, which is housing, um, jobs, education, and um, housing, jobs, education, and healthcare that that's what safety looks like. You know, if, if, if uh, police meant safety, then Fortune 500 CEOs would live in the hood, right? Because there's no shortage <laughs> of police there. Exactly. But, um, you know, what actually keeps people safe is, you know, clean water and air and, and making sure that people are healthy and have health care and, and mental health care is extremely important in that, to be included in that. Um, making sure everybody has a roof over their head and adequate housing and support and uh, education, after school programs, counselors in those schools and, um, and jobs, economy. Uh, and and, and um, everybody agreed in that presentation and now they just have to act on it. Now they came out, they defunded uh, by a couple hundred million dollars, which was big, but they still have three billion. So uh, we need to still fight. Um, but another, another motion came out of that to end um, police calls, police answering nonviolent calls. So those calls would be redirected, which is about 98% of their calls. Um, be redirected to non-law enforcement unarmed first responders, which is extremely important. So that's some of the work that this liberation movement is doing here that's, that's so incredible, but I can go on and on, as you can see. Definitely. Um, and another big thing that we're considering here in Chicago that I think aligns with that, I'm not sure if he was, he was, if he was um, working on this, but in Oakland, I think they now can vote no confidence in their police chief and fire the police chief um, if, if the police chief is deemed, uh, you know, unfit. And so um, that's something we're wrestling with here in Chicago. So again, I just appreciate all the work that you're doing in LA um, because we, we use those as benchmarks, you know, as su a success, right? So uh, that was partially why I asked about your success stories because I know uh, that the challenges are different in different places. Um, another well, I thing. I would say real quick, we, we, I mean, we protested Charlie Beck, uh, the police chief here, got him ousted. There's been a lot of, the last sheriff protested him. So, you know, we might not have a method, a, a legal method to do it, but we, we got out there and we got him gone. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the work that they've been doing with Measure R, the legislative work, and now Measure J, um, you know, if you're in LA, yes on Measure J. Um, but those types of, uh, that work is incredible, but it's really more than anything, the community work that they're doing and the building of this liberation movement um, and the coalitions that are built around here. Everybody doesn't necessarily agree, but we agree that everybody needs to be free. Um, and, and it's been really, really incredible, uh, especially um, uh, the intersectional uh, part of it and making sure that we center those who are most vulnerable. Appreciate that, Kendrick. And um, I think this next question really is, 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 is one of the most important ones. It seems like every time we take two to three steps forward, we take five to 10 steps back. I mean, you look at what happened with Breonna Taylor. You look at how many folks have just not received justice in general. Um, and it's tiring. It's, it's exhausting. 
um, not just mentally, um, but physically and emotionally. And, you know, you look at what's happening, you know, it, with the Supreme Court, and you look at what's happening with the, the federal court system, and you really wonder, um, how, do you, how do folks stay motivated? And what advice would you share for the thousands of advocates that are tuning in tonight uh, to stay committed to the fight uh, for racial justice, to continue to advance uh, their advocacy and activate their communities? Because, you know, we know that it just seems like sometimes uh, you just want to give up, but we know that we can't. And so, you know, what would you leave this 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 audience with? What would you share with them that keeps you going um, in your work? And and what would you share to motivate us and as well as the audience and folks across the world to continue in this fight? Because we know um, this is a marathon, not a sprint. Yeah, I think, um, man, my mind goes so many places. But one thing that I, I want to say is, you see, um, just um, it, it's very uh, frustrating and 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 discouraging to look at what is being presented to us um, through the media and what leaders are doing and who's been elected and who. Anyway, um, but I think you know i so i'll just put it like this i'm an abolitionist right i believe that these systems of police like policing is slave catching the continuation of slave catching and um it's the, the direct lineage right and um same thing with prisons like prisons is a continuation of slavery under the guise of the 13th amendment um you have capitalism um and so many different systems that uh, p play into oppression, right? That uh, lead the charge on oppression, right? And I believe that we have to uproot those. Uh, my favorite analogy is a bad seed produces a bad tree, produces a bad fruit. Um, good tree produces a good, uh, good seed produces a good tree, produces good fruit. And that's, they, the systems will always operate how that seed was intended, right? And so I look at those systems as bad seeds and that we need to uproot those trees, right? And resoil and plant new ones that are based in care and accountability and love, radical love of our communities that centers the most vulnerable, that they are intended to care for our communities and liberate folks and, and, and love folks. Um, I think that is really important. And when you have that framework and you start to look at the systems and the, and the winds a different way, because part of abolition as a framework for activism is uprooting those um, systems internally, like how we've been indoctrinated, how we've been educated with wrong um, ideologies, with oppressive ideologies, the anti-Blackness that is internal, the anti, you know, whatever it is, right? The, um, the misogyny that is internal that, you know, that we start to start, we start to hate ourselves or, or um, see wins framed as losses a lot of the time. Part of what we've been indoctrinated and educated to do is see the wins as losses. Um, because um, the oppressor has, has um, controlled and developed our education systems and our media systems. And, you know, there is no incentive to um, really highlight liberation and highlight uh, the wins that, that we have. So part of it is continuing to understand better um, and I wish I had time to give examples, but to understand better what actually is going on in the world and, and developing relationships and community, getting involved with organizations um, that, are, that have that framework and that are, you know, prone to educating the community and, and reshaping the way that we think and, and, and um, really pushing for liberation not tinkering around the edges of things, right? Um, and then you start to see things differently. Now, sometimes it's hard because the rest of the world doesn't necessarily see it that way, but it keeps you going. It keeps you motivated. And, and some of the things that, um, I think it's really good for my mental health to be surrounded with community that, that, um, 
that understands that and under and has the same goals right um to really truly liberate folks and internally and externally right but um i i have to also um take care of my mental health. So capitalism encourages us to keep going and grinding and always be doing this and that and 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 for for what purpose? For profit, right? And for whatever it is, right? And sometimes we have to extract that. Not sometimes. We always have to extract that and separate that and understand that it is important to center health. Health the collective health and your own health. So take time to breathe, take time to imagine better. What does liberation look like? What does liberate, what, who are the most vulnerable people in your life? Close your eyes and imagine those, the most vulnerable people in your life that you truly want to liberate, that you want to imagine a different reality where they are safe, where they are thriving, where they're at peace, where they have everything they need, right? What does that world look like? And then realize that whatever you come up with is informed by a bunch of oppressive, um, of oppressive um, ideologies that have been forced on us, right? So then the next day, so even that beautiful world, that utopia that you, that you imagined isn't good enough. So the next day, imagine even better and continue to fight for that world. Imagine better the next day. Imagine better even the next day, right? Always imagine a more liberated world where these people that we love so much are taken care of um, and loved in, in beautiful and radical uh, ways. Um, and I think that that is really important. And also imagine that for yourself and start building that now. Um, what does that look like for you in your everyday life to take a second, not be so reactive, not, not try to respond to every single thing that you see on Twitter, take time, so much time away from your phone and social media and really decide with your community that you build and the organizations that you get involved with, what the strategy is moving forward, what those goals are that we're gonna set and to focus on those because this is a very long fight. And I'll leave it, I'll, I'll leave it with this. The movement moves without you. We constantly hear that in, in, in um, liberation spaces, right? The movement moves without you. Now that means two things, or you can see this two different ways. I see it two different ways. One, if you're not involved in liberation, the movement moves without you. So you either get involved and be on the right side of history or you get run over by it. Um, the other thing it says for those who are, are already involved in liberation is don't let your ego convince you that if you're not doing the work 24 seven, that it's not gonna get done. The movement will move, it, whether it was here before you and it will be here after you, people will step in and do what needs to be done. So take the time to make sure that part of the, the liberation movement is making sure that you are healthy and making decisions with a clear mind. Um, and that's what, you know, group-centered leadership looks like, uh, as Ella Baker would say, not just a leader, one leader, right, but a group-centered leadership of making sure everybody has those clear-minded um, uh, decisions to organize their sphere of influence and be a part of the liberation movement. Definitely. Well, Kendrick, I appreciate your time. I appreciate your work. We at the Shriver Center appreciate everything you do to activate the nation through your art, through your advocacy, and through your fight for liberation, not just through build power, but by you being you. So thank you so much, sir. Continue to fight, uh, continue to advocate, and we hope to have a conversation with you in the future. Of course. Thank you. Awesome. Hi. You want to know one of the reasons why I chose Striver? because of housing rights. Everyone should have a stable home and access to economic sustainability. Shriver was made for this moment. A moment when so many of us, admittedly belatedly for some, are finally coming to the realization that the very systems and laws and structures and institutions on which our country is built, indeed the history we thought we knew, is flawed. Shriver has long known this and for decades has been doing the hard work 
of unseating, uprooting, altering, and improving those systems with an eye toward making them more fundamentally fair. That is why I am proud to support Shriver at the nexus of racial and economic justice during this most crucial time. As we sit on the precipice of true economic and racial justice, we are still living in a country where mothers and daughters aren't even safe in their homes, where brothers and fathers aren't even safe in the parks, where fear-mongering has outweighed truth and facts and replacing peace and tranquility. My name is Antonio Marshall, and I want to thank each and every one of you for joining the Shriver Center for this very powerful evening. And I hope that you all leave here feeling inspired to go activate your local community. Here at the Shriver Center, I work to fund the mission, but tonight I come to you as a donor of the mission and a fellow disruptor of the system, but also as a black father that cringes at a system that is so callously taking black children away from their families and incarcerating black mothers from suffering from the ill effects of poverty. So I'm inviting you to join me in making an investment and making a donation to the Shriver Center and helping us reach our $100,000 goal for the week. And I want to be clear about something. I don't care if it's $5, $10, or $10,000. Every dollar counts. So if you look above me, you can find the donate button where you can make a donation online or you can text Shriver Center to 41. 444 where you receive a link to make a donation through your phone and these donations they will allow us to make sure that families are being kept together that we're ending mass incarceration and that regardless of immigration status everyone has access to health care so let's do this together let's donate and donate like our lives and everyone else lives depend on it so once again, above me, you can find a donation button to make a donation online, or you can text Shriver Center to 41444, where you will receive a link to your phone. Thank you for funding the mission. And let's not forget to join us tomorrow evening for our conversation with Nicole Hannah Jones, Dr. Ibram Kendi, and our very own Audra Wilson. So people, don't forget to vote. Please get out and vote, people! My name is Tamita Solomon, aka Trap Bob, and my work stands for hope, strength, and uplifting my communities. I aim to create representation for Black women and the Black community. I truly believe we'll never find peace until we can find equality. As we close, I want to remind everyone of tonight's purpose, activating the nation. We've shown you inspiring ways people are using different forms of activism. Let me leave you with this call to action. Use your voice, activate your abilities. Everyone can and should do something to push for racial justice. So go ahead and have a difficult conversation with your colleagues or your family. Vote for policies that create equity. If you live in Illinois, vote for the fair tax. Listen to the voices of Black, Latino, Asian, Native American, and other communities of color. And most importantly, help organizations like Shriver that fight for racial justice with a donation. Thank you, and we'll see you tomorrow.